Um, hi, Trent. Thank you so much for helping my project. Uh, could you say a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so my name is Trent Belke. Um, I live currently in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and you know, definitely had some Legos growing up uh, involving space, but uh, haven't been too active in the in the space community since then, but excited for this interview. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, about some of the things that you do get excited about, some of your hobbies? Yeah, um, I love to hike. I love the outdoors. Uh, I, I enjoy uh, running and exercising. Um, I still play and watch probably too much soccer. Uh, that, that was always my big uh, sport growing up. Um, and other than that, uh, professional sense, I love software. I love, uh, you know, calculations and, and uh, building advanced software. So, um, you know, those are the types of things that I'm really into. Uh, and what got you into uh, software? Uh, I like the challenge of it. Um, I like being able to go at different things in different ways and kind of allows both the, the left brain and, and right brain side of me, uh, even though I know those terms are outdated, but you know, the creative side and the logical thinking side to, to both coexist and to both use uh, both of those, of those skills within my day-to-day -day job. And uh, were you like into computers and programming like middle school and high school or like at what point did you like actually start thinking about software? Yeah, um, my mom was actually a developer, uh, a software developer um, growing up for me. Um, so I've always been very close to it. I was always very intrigued. Um, you know, she was a mainframe developer. So I was always so interested to see like the black screens and, and the code running and um, she would tell me stories about even programming on uh, index cards and stuff. Um, so I've always been around it. Um, I probably picked it up, you know, around end of middle school, beginning of high school, um, and then actually worked as a developer um, to get myself through college. And that's that's awesome. <laughs> like, well, um, did you know that NASA is planning to send astronauts to the moon again for the first time since 1972? Um, if you uh, asked me this a couple of weeks ago, uh, prior to signing up for this, I probably would have said no. Um, since then, I have I have done a little bit of research in, in preparation for this, so I, I could try to answer some questions uh, more in-depthly than just uh, whatever comes up to the top of my head. Um, but I now know about it um, and, and have read a little bit about it. Now, um, do you think it's uh, something that NASA should be doing or somebody should be doing to to make more people aware of it because you're not alone out of um out of all the people that I interviewed that aren't like active members in the space community I'd say about 80 percent of them have have no idea that we're planning to send people back to the moon um yeah I I mean I guess it would depend on if they need a lot more public support for it or not um I think those who are, uh, you know, want to learn about it, I, even a quick Google search that I did, there's definitely not a lack of resources out there on the internet for you to read about it. Um, but, you know, as it relates to maybe in the day-to-day -day news, um, maybe just some progression updates to get people excited for it. Um, Cause I know I, growing up, I was excited to see, you know, when the space missions would launch, but other than that, that was really the only time I paid attention to space. Um, so, you know, those types of things, um, you know, would probably excite the general public using me as kind of the, the basis. Now, um, how do you get your news? Um, it's a great question. Um, I use, uh, so I, I have a Google phone. Um, so I use kind of the Google news where, you know, kind of self separates based upon what I currently look at. Um, but then I also have a subscription to The Economist um, so I read that every day. Um, and they actually have mentioned NASA's things to the moon, though, to be honest, I kind of self-select read over those. Um, but maybe now I'll start to pay a little bit more attention to them. Uh, and other than that, um, you know, just some random articles that get sent between friends. Uh, do you read The Economist uh, digitally or like the physically print version? Um, I used to read the, the digital print. I've since moved to digital or I, the paper print. I, I've now moved to digital. Um, I got sad just recycling my economist that was like, you know, 60 pages.
pages every week, I can do some more to, you know, be a little bit more sustainable. No, that totally makes sense. I actually just discovered my uh, library here in Harris County uh, in Houston. Um, we have access to this thing called Libby and you can watch, uh, you know, listen to audiobooks and read electronic books, but they also have like The Economist and there's like an unlimited number of subscriptions uh, on, so you don't have to wait for people to check it in or check it out. So pretty much everybody in Harris County could read The Economist for free. All they had to do is get a library card and download this app. It's like amazing. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that, that's great. I, I really like The Economist. I, I like the non-US based viewpoint from some of the US based news um, and think it's a pretty reputable source. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big favor of The Economist. Yeah. And they cover a wide range of subjects too. I mean, like you're talking about space and technology and um, of course, economics and <laughs> politics mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Seems really good. Um, mm -hmm. If more people knew about going to the moon, do you think they would support it or be like, oh my gosh, why are we spending money on that? Um, I'm not really sure. I'm not... I, maybe I just think a lot of people are like me, but I don't really have a sway one way or the another. I, I know it brings about scientific research. Are there more, you know, maybe more effective ways to explore that scientific research, you know, of not going to the moon or spending that money elsewhere? I don't really think I'm a person to judge that. So, um, you know, people much smarter than I want to go to the moon, more power to them. Um, and, and, you know, I, I won't object, but I'm not a, maybe the most vocal supporter of it either. Um, so I, it's probably a poor answer, but uh, I, I think there's just a, a, probably a majority of people who don't really feel strongly one way or the other. <laughs> yeah, I, I know there's so much out there to try to make us feel strong about so many things that I think it kind of makes us all kind of like, ah, you know, in order just to survive all these <laughs> strong feelings and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But whenever you think about the future of humanity, um, what do you see? I mean, what does it look like to you? Whew, hopefully a world with no more COVID in it. Um, that, would, that would be a good first step. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but long-term future. Um, you know, I, I do think there's probably um, gonna be further space exploration. Um, I, I, I see us, you know, with all of the media news with Elon Musk about wanting to go to Mars and set up a, a colony on Mars, you know, I'm guessing that will probably happen with the amount of excitement that there seems to be for that. Um, I, though I primarily see us staying as a, you know, earthbound species, uh, or at least a, a vast, vast majority of us will say earthbound. Um, but uh, I, I do think we're going to continue to kind of push the boundaries of, of where humans can go and what humans can do. Um, you know, now until, you know, the end of civilization. Um, yeah, and, you know, we, one of the reasons Elon uh, talks about building that a million person city on Mars is self-sustainable is kind of like a, a set of threats that could kind of end all life as we know it, you know, I mean, asteroids, nuclear war, the pandemic, these types of things. I, I, I was wondering, um, in, in terms of preparing for the future and, and planning for the present, or maybe vice versa, um, I, I mean, how much how much energy do you think we should kind of put into, um, you know, trying to survive those types of things, those world-ending events? Yeah, I think I think kind of COVID has showed us, you know, we definitely need to be more prepared for the future. Um, so I know that there was some investments going into, you know, the, the research around um, viruses and such. And, you know, I think COVID has now expanded that, but I think that should also be expanded to other, you know, large life threats to civilization as we know it, um, whether that be natural disasters, whether that be, um, you know, people bound disasters like a atomic war uh, or, um, extraterrestrial disasters like an asteroid or a comet uh, hitting the planet. Uh, do you think uh, humanity will ever make it to another star system? Uh, 
Do I think so? Um, I never want to bet against the human race, so I'll probably say yes. Um, you know, humans always find a way to, to do the impossible. Um, if it was safe and affordable, would you take a trip to space? Um, I guess when you ask this, is it like um, the current, you know, Elon Musk and his company, SpaceX, like taking up passengers where it's, you know, barely outside, some may even debate, are you really in space? Or are you saying it like all the way to the moon or to Mars? Um, now that would be uh, Jeff Bezos's company, uh, Blue Origin. Or Jeff Bezos, just, yeah, sorry. yeah, they just 15 minute thing. Uh, Elon, uh, you know, he'll put you in orbit. <laughs> so okay. you know, there won't be any question about being in space. Okay, okay, I got my, got my space race uh, competitors uh, um, mistaken there. Um, but I guess to answer that, um, I would probably do orbit. Um, I don't know if I would do, you know, going to the moon or going to Mars. Um, now imagine this, uh, Elon is successful in building uh, his million person uh, city on Mars. Uh, one of your ancestors, not ancestors, descendants, um, you know, actually immigrates to Mars. And your great, great, great granddaughter is doing a project for her social studies history class, whatever. And it's like, you know, what was life like before we started expanding out into the, the solar system? And uh, she comes across this video and, um, you know, whatever you say next can help her get an A. What would that be? Ooh, what a question. Um, I was never good at getting A's in school, so this is probably going to be a bad resource for her. But uh, <laughs> ah, what was it like prior to? Um, you know, it, it was very earthly focused. We were very focused on what are our limited resources and how we can best achieve those. Um, and a lot of our culture and civilization um, was created with that scarcity mindset. Um, so maybe in the future, you know, a lot more of that scarcity mindset will go away because you know, now we're not limited by the amount of resources that are just here on earth. Um, so maybe we can expand upon that. Um, so yeah, so I think that would be maybe the largest change in culture. So that would be, you know, what, what is earth like right now? That's awesome. Um, yeah, no, scarcity uh, is definitely, the sense of scarcity, I think, drives so much negative human behavior. The idea that uh, you have to go out and, and try to claim resources because if you don't, they, there won't be anything left for you. And, you know, um, I, I was listening to this guy, uh, he's like the, the president of the, the Mars Society uh, and his name just slipped my mind. But uh, he likes to say there's no such thing as natural resources. There's only raw materials and it's human ingenuity that actually takes those raw materials and turns them into natural resources. I uh, like oil, for example, it used to be just this thing that would destroy your crops that would come out of the ground. You want, there's like nothing you could do with it, but then we learned how to refine it. We created a combustion engine and actually turned that, that, that raw material into a resource using creativity and ingenuity. Um, and therefore, really the more brains we could get to actually inventing things and solving problems and figuring out what's going on in the world is, is better for all of us. And, um, you know, every human has a brain. It's just about getting it applied uh, to problems in, in that way. And I was just wondering what you thought of, of that point of view. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Um to a sense, um, cause you know, that we're also limited by, um, you know, the base elements of, you know, once I turn oil um, and use it in the combustion engine, you know, my output is CO2, I know, and then it takes me a lot of energy and resources then to turn that back into oil per se. So, um, and the moment I change a, a base element, you know, let's say I take an electron away from um, carbon and turn it into, so I wasn't good in school, whatever is, you know, one electron less uh, of carbon, you know, it, it takes me a lot of energy to, to rebuild those base elements. Um, but yeah, I would say to a point, um, I, I would agree with that. Now you mentioned energy. That's a big concern for humanity. 
um, you know, our energy consumption has been going up exponentially. Um, and there's no reason to think it's going to stop. Um, but, you know, mentally try to create a sphere that has the same diameter as the Earth's orbit and think about the surface area of that sphere. And then think about the cross section of the Earth. So essentially that sphere represents all the energy that the sun is actually producing. And then the cross section of the earth is how much of that energy is actually falling on the earth. And so by looking at the proportion between those two, you get a sense of how much of the sun's energy is actually powering everything on earth that's ever happened. And that ratio is something like one to 700 billion, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So essentially if we could figure out some way to capture more of the sun's energy, we literally have infinite amount of energy available to us. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, going back to the Economist, there was an article that I think it was only you know X percentage of the Sahara Desert need to be covered in solar panels to meet all current um, supply of energy needs throughout you know every person in the world. It was like a very small amount of just like a very you know place where nobody would probably care from a humanity standpoint if we would put a bunch of solar panels just because it's not fertile land it's not developed land currently um, and you can also take that and apply it to any other desert uh, in the world but I thought that was a really interesting thing. It is yeah but of course terrestrial solar power is always going to have the trouble that um, at least for roughly half of the day it's not facing towards the sun. Mm -hmm. True so then comes in energy storage uh, which is, I think, you know, the biggest debate in the uh, renewable energy space, because each one of our current, you know, most renewable energies, whether that be wind, power, um, you know, all have those dead moments. And those dead moments happen to coincide with when humans probably need the most amount of electricity in their lives at night um, or, you know, in, in bad weather. So, um, you know, energy storage becomes a very important thing. Uh, but uh, what do you think about actually creating, uh, you know, these huge arrays of solar panels that are in orbit around the sun that either you're doing work there locally, like you have data centers in the sky doing some type of simulations, crypto mining, whatever, you know, floats our boat, um, or being able to, to beam that power uh, to wherever we need it, you know, then you're, you know, you're able to get access 24 seven. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anywhere where you can get a controlled, renewable um, and consistent source of energy, uh, I think is really, you know, the, the next golden ticket in terms of short term humanitarian goals. Um, what do you see? I mean, do you think humanity is living up to its potential? I don't know if I would put their potential on a human species. Um, I think potential is something that each person individually looks at, maybe of themselves. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think I would judge, you know, do I think my cat, it, and like my cat that's probably running around and maybe you've seen in the background, you know, is living up to his quote unquote potential. Um, and in the same way, I don't think an entire race of, of a species has a potential. Um, but I do think humans find ways based upon our rewards and incentives and risks and trade-offs between those three. Um, so, you know, do what every person suits for themselves. Um, because I also think everyone can make their own decisions um, and, and be who they think is the best version of themselves without needing to be judged by others of, if that truly is the best version of themselves. So I guess long story short, um, if you had to give me a yes or no, I would say yes, because I think every person is living up to their potential. Um, but I, I don't know if I would put the word potential on a human race. I, I do think it's interesting about the cats. I mean, looking at it from a, a kind of like a outside standpoint, I think the cats have done a marvelous job. They uh, are well provided for, they have houses built for them. They get to sit around and philosophize all the time. 
uh, and uh, they get to really manage their their contact with other beings uh, to, to be whatever they want. So true. You know, I think my cat probably has, you know, hit the hit the lottery uh, or the jackpot in terms of uh, living abilities. But you know, for every you know, I need to remember for every one cat uh, that's like him, there's you know six others that were, you know, passed away before even their first. Um, um, you know, year of life and all the other cats that are, you know, abandoned in strays that need to fight for all their food. So, um, yeah, but definitely, I, you know, house cats have, have got it made. They live much better. My cat at least lives much better than I do. That's awesome. I'm a happy cat. I, so I have over a thousand more of these interviews that I plan to do. One a day to the end of 2024. And I see it as kind of a time capsule for uh, future generations, not even yet born. So who cares about the YouTube count today? It's, uh, you know, the people that this is meant for is like 100 years from now, 200 years from now, that type of thing. Um, what are some type of questions you think I should ask people? Um, like people between now and 2024, or, you know, what questions would you ask people 100 years from now? Uh, what questions should I ask uh, between now and the end of 2024? Uh, for those people who will be watching it 100, 200 years from now. Like, if you could imagine you were watching a video from 100 years ago or 200 years ago, and you could ask those people any question about their time, you know, would that give you some insight into to what, what we should be capturing through this project? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess I would ask, like, what, what do you enjoy most about your your life, um, what do you what do you do that that currently makes you happy? Because um, I'd be really interested in that uh, with a person who lived a hundred years before I did, um, just to see a how it changed. And you know, I also have a hypothesis that things that we thought were fun 20, 20 40, 100 years ago probably are the things that like we now try to avoid as much as possible. Oh. Um. Well, uh, that sounds like a really valid question. Uh, what would be your answer? Um, I guess I really enjoy, uh, you know, being able to walk around and experience nature um, and experience nature's beauty. Um, I enjoy being able to take off of work and go outside and breathe fresh air um, when I'm not living in the heart of a city and, uh, you know, enjoy just being by myself away from other humans and experiencing what nature has to offer. Your, your great, great, great granddaughter on Mars is very jealous of you. I know it. <laughs> living in a habitat, having to wear a suit every time she goes outside, this idea of fresh air, she's like, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good point. <laughs> so... Well, I know we covered a lot of things. Um, was there anything that uh, you wanted to talk about or did you have any questions for me? Um, I guess I would ask, you know, what are you most excited about? I know you're really passionate about going back to the moon. Like what, what do you hope to get out of, uh, you know, that um, expedition and, and what do you hope to get out of, you know, more and further space exploration? Yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of it ultimately comes down to, um, a view about the future of humanity. I mean, do you see humanity as branching out into the rest of the solar system and beyond? Do you see that as a good thing? Assuming you can answer yes to both of those, going to the moon just seems like a logical step um, in terms of progressing towards there, you know, kind of expanding out the physical envelope of humanity. Um, and, you know, if we could awaken uh, within ourselves a vision of actually, you know, how huge the universe is and our ability to actually go and you know see more of it maybe we could take the focus less on kind of like the conflicts down here on earth and actually find some way to you know bind uh, work together to actually go and and uh explore that you know i, I mean it's like I, I feel like we're like uh, stuck on an island and we have multiple groups and we're all trying to you know uh uh, get our resources and put our points of view onto each other and create our tribes and make them stronger. 
but if we work together, maybe we could build a boat. And imagine finding lots of islands and a continent and all these things. You know, it's just like, I mean, that's what gets me excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, I thank you again so much for signing up for my project. Uh, so Absolutely. I, I'm hoping to have a huge party at the end of 2024 whenever I get to that last interview and you have to come. Sounds good. If you send me an invite, I'll try my best to be there. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Well, Trent, you have a good rest of your day. And if you know anybody else that would be willing to have a conversation, I hope you send them my way. Sounds good. Well, do Nathan and have a good evening. Okay. Bye-bye.